everyone, for a filthy lot of entertainment, welcome to Drawn and Cornered. It's the show that corners today's best comic book artists as they answer deep dive questions while they draw piece suggested by you, the viewer. After the show, you can bid on the art and all the proceeds will go to our guest's charity of choice. So make sure you watch through to the end to see the final product. Today in the drawing chair is Simon Roy. You know him for his mind-blowing science fiction work on books like Prophet, Habitat, and his new series from Image Comics, Protector. Simon, thanks so much for being our first ever guest. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. That's a, it was a great intro. <laughs> so what I wanted to ask you first off is what are you going to be drawing for us today and which charity will this benefit? Okay, so uh, I solicited some suggestions. Uh, online and i'm going to be doing a caveman with a mech so uh, <laughs> it's not uh, not out of your uh, out of your out of your uh, your depth of uh, of knowledge at all exactly it's very much uh, it might be directly in my wheelhouse um but and then the the charity it'll be going to is the habitat conservation and trust foundation uh awesome let's kick it off with our first question for you today Right now, on. for anyone who follows you on social media, your love for animals is obviously no secret. Where does this stem from, and how does this make its way into your own uniquely designed alien creatures? Ooh. Um, I I grew up in like the couch and valley on Vancouver Island, and um, a big part of living there was uh, getting to run around in the woods and you know catch creatures and race tadpoles and that kind of thing. Um, and even occasionally have uh, the German shepherds of the next door neighbor catch and kill deer, um, which is a little rowdy, but yeah, I remember, yeah, I'm just thinking about a disturbing thing, walking home from school and seeing a, a deer's carcass like spread out over the entire path. Uh, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked, <laughs> but. Uh, That's all right. Um, but. Uh, they always see the, deer, the deer's carcass uh, uh, burnt itself into your into your psyche so deeply that it uh, obviously affected your your creatures. Well, exactly. When I also like uh, I was very much into uh, wildlife conservation when I was younger, um, and uh, wildlife illustration. And then from there, I started. I got into more like the anatomy of animals once I got into art school. Um, so it's just kind of always being into animals and how they work and how they're how they're how how an animal's body is similar and different to a human body and thinking of all the parallels and uh, that sort of thing um yeah yeah oh that's amazing uh now everyone knows that you're uh, you're very, also very much into science fiction now science fiction has always been one of our best tools for exploring current fears and cultural upheaval now why do you think we need to look uh, to the future in order to understand the present Ooh, um, one, one reason is maybe just that, uh, if you're not, if you're telling a story in the future, um, you're a little bit insulated from, uh, I don't know, potentially treading on people's toes in the present for one thing. Um, but also you can, uh, I don't know, you can, you can extrapolate from trends and like then create like a, a detailed caricature of, of how you think you know, the current state of things um, is going to end up. And, uh, you know, through, through that, you can, you, can, you can comment on the present or you can, I don't know, build, build your own little world in a bottle and mm -hmm. uh, figure, out, figure out parameters inside that, that um, I don't know, that can explore the themes that you, that are maybe pertinent to your, your current life or that sort of thing. Well, what's really interesting for me is that uh, a lot of a lot of my sci-fi um, understanding uh, of, especially in regards to like, you know, current cultural situations, comes from for me some of the darker sci-fi's out there, you know, like you know, like the Blade Runners and things like that. I remember having conversations with my dad, you know, and he was saying, "Man, I don't understand a lot of these Hollywood movies. So they're so all the all the sci-fi stuff is so bleak." And uh, now that we live in this current, you know, COVID world, like it's starting to make sense. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I was talking to a, a, a guy who works in my building here uh, yesterday and how 
yeah, it's we're you know we're living through this sci-fi scenario. You know, we're kind of this is a thing that's been explored in fiction a lot, and all of a sudden, it's here. You know, and it's uh, you know, and we're seeing how we uh, how we succeed and, and hugely fail throughout. There's a one thing I have noticed about your work is that there's a lot of Russian influence in it, uh, from cosmonauts to motorball, among uh, uh, you know among others. Now you even did an unused variant cover for Black Science where the title was written in Russian. Now where does that influence come from? Because as far as I'm aware, I don't know if you have any Russian family background. Yeah, no, none, none in particular. I'm, I just uh, at some point in in my teenage years, I just really got into it. And uh, I think it's like a weird flow of like starting with like reading Asterix and getting interested in Roman history from there. And then kind of, I don't know, as I got older, encountering more and more of the imagery from the late Soviet period and like early post-Soviet period. Um, what, what is it specifically about that period that was so fascinating to you? Uh, I think it's, it's the combo of um, basically just like the the explicit layers of history present um, in a lot of these things. Cause you know, like in a, you know, in, in the post-Soviet space, you have, you know, new nation building projects happening under the shadow of all this kind of totalitarian utopian communism. And then even that communism uh, picked up a lot of its um, influences visually and whatnot from the, the cultures that preceded it. So like there's lots of communist mosaics and that kind of stuff that come from a very strong tradition um, of building mosaics for like the Orthodox church, you know, and there's lots of, so there's lots of interesting syncretic things uh, in this space where you can like, you can kind of pull apart all these distinct threads of history, um, which is really cool, especially like growing up on the West coast where, um, you know, our, the history of this current society that lives here is like the roots are pretty shallow, you know, mm -hmm. like nothing's particularly old here. Um, plus in Vancouver, like we constantly destroy everything that's old and make, you know, there's always new, it, there's all, like the past is always being destroyed and uh, covered over. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's not unique to Vancouver, but you know. It's certainly one of the traits of the city, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Are you aware of those photographers that kind of infiltrate these old abandoned uh, Soviet facilities and take photographs of them? And have you ever wanted to do that yourself? I have wanted to go to um, some of these abandoned Soviet places. Um, and back in 2008, I went on a um, kind of student exchange sort of program to Ukraine for uh, a month and a bit. Um, and while there, we did, we did arrange to go to Chernobyl. Um, oh. However, it, uh, the fixer, the fixer never, never delivered on the goods. And I, uh, I did, I mean, walking around Kiev and Lviv and, uh, you have Pretoria and all these different spots. Uh, you get a lot of the same cool history, but, um, not quite the, the radioactive magic as, uh, as you get in, in Chernobyl. Um, but I mean, when I was there, they still advised you to not eat um, ground fruit, like uh, strawberries and stuff that grow laying on the ground. And um, yeah. I mean, I think I did at some point, but you're not supposed to. Um, Are you serious? Yeah, I mean, they were really tasty on the strawberries. You know, if anyone, if anyone, you know, that as someone that knows you, that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> It explain, in fact, it, it's starting to explain a lot about who you are and your personality. I'm just slightly irradiated. That's really the. <laughs> now I got. I have. An, I have a, a, a funny question to sort of lob at you. Now, are you uh, are you at all aware of any of the other famous Simon Roy's out there? And uh, <laughs> and if so, how often do you get mistaken for the Canadian Hall of Fame racquetball champ? <laughs> I I like that there is. Uh, a presumably French Canadian. I don't know Simon Roy out there. Who's uh, I think so. Yeah. Um, I think the only the, the other Simon Roy that I know of is actually a guy in Yorkshire who is a wildlife photographer, which for me feels I'm like, well, that's he's quite good. You know, he gets some pretty great candid snaps of like, you know, like a field mouse on a flower. And like, 
you know, that kind of thing. So it's, uh, I'm proud to share a name. You ever thought about picking up a racket, a racquetball and just start <laughs> hitting, the, hitting the wall? I don't know. What do they even do? They, I guess they just, it's just, you're just hitting the wall, right? I actually, I'm sad to say, I don't know anything at all about racquetball. But, <laughs> but one well, day. Now you started your you started your publishing career in web comics, um, and like a lot of cartoonists, you sort of crafted your own stories and published them your own way. Now, how does that independent mindedness translate to your current state of your career? Um, it's probably helped and harmed it in different ways. Uh, I know that like it it I so right now my I'm I have a comic coming out through Image Comics that I've co that I co wrote, and then um, I'm producing a lot of collaborative stuff through my Patreon. So uh, in 2017, I think 2017, 2018, um, I, uh, I wrote, I co-wrote with uh, Jess Pollard um, and drew a whole bunch of stories there. And I'm currently working on stuff with um, a pal of mine, Damon Gentry. Um, so I kind of, I do a lot of stuff by myself um, for a small audience. Um, but my initial reluctance to do, uh, more, more for work for hire in comics, um, has meant that I actually haven't made very many comics for like the mainstream market. In a right. Of and that, that, that's, that's what lead, what's going to basically lead me to my, my next question, which is why, I mean, I don't, I don't see you working for a lot of the major publishers, uh, you know, working for someone, working for someone. You know, the bulk of your work has been through like image, dark horse, creator owned titles. Uh, is that, on, and that basically, is that on purpose? Do you prefer having control over your work or is there more of a desire to do those superhero books with the majors? Um, it's definitely, uh, when I made the, when I made most of these decisions, I was very keen on not doing, um, on not doing work for hire because I'd like, I wanted to keep my comic work as something I was doing for fun for myself. <laughs> Um, so I kind of shifted into doing more, uh, illustration. So I've done a lot of, I mean, so, so basically that's kind of after doing profit, um, I've mainly just been doing illustration, uh, for kind of my day job and then doing, uh, doing comics that I have like complete control over, um, mm -hmm. which has, which has been good in some ways, but also, um, there's something to be said for volume in terms of like, people being aware of you because your stuff is on the shelves all the time because you're a presence and you're kind of, you're hanging over them at all times as a consumer. Um, so uh, it's definitely been more relaxing to avoid the, uh, the weekly the, or the monthly grind rather. But um, I don't, I don't know that it's helped my comics career. Uh, that's really, I still have one, which is pretty cool, but you know, <laughs> Well, back in back in two thousand and nine, you, uh, you you said in an interview that you'd most like to do a Doctor Doom story. Does that still interest you, or have things kind of changed? I'd still do that, but it's mainly because I uh, I like the idea of digging into that that period of time, like the the early nineties when the Soviet Union collapsed, and like there's weird civil wars and little statelets and separatist groups kicking off of everywhere. Um, in which you know there's a lot of room in that to you know make a little doctor doom you know like is you there could, any other... sorry go ahead or, or no it's just just it's uh, i don't know there's there's fun there's fun space to to i don't know trick people maybe into looking at shit that i think is interesting that's maybe more but <laughs> i'm like doctor doom i could trick people into liking my interests <laughs> you know whereas <laughs> other other characters i don't really um i can't it's hard to find that self-serving uh, you know, in for lots of the other mainstream superhero characters. So, um, and also just like I, when I grew up, I didn't, I didn't really have access to regular superhero comics. So I never, um, I never really got into them. So it's just like, I'm just, I just don't really, it's, it's too late for me. It's too late for me to get into what, them. What were you, what were you uh, reading uh, instead of superhero comics? Um, lots of like, uh, Lots of Tintin and Asterix and stuff from the, the local library, mainly. Um, and like Calvin and Hobbes and Bloom County and uh, 
Yeah, yeah. And what, I think what, like Get Fuzzy. Lots, you know, some of those late 90s, early 2000s uh, newspaper strip collections. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just, yeah, lots of, lots of sci-fi paperbacks that um, I was more interested in, I think, than a lot of the comics that I saw. Like, I like to draw, uh, and I like science fiction, and I never really find, like, I rarely have found science fiction comics that I like, so I'm always like, how would I make, you know, something that I would like to read in comic book form? A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, creative choices uh, are, are very selfish, you know, I, I, for me, yeah. when, I, when I write and, and, and look at, you know, uh, film and TV projects and things like that, I want to do stuff that I want to watch. You know, yeah, so exactly. it makes sense. Now, what can you what can you tell us about this particular drawing uh, that you said uh, you did when you were a kid? Well, uh, frankly, I don't know how you got your hands. <laughs> that's that's the my internet, top, man. My top secret shit, as is obvious from that image. Uh, yeah, I think I think that was just my dad got something where my dad got this big uh, like weekly planner. I think as a promotion from. A company that he was working for that he ended up using so he ended up being like well you can have this so it was like a giant big binder with like endless endless pages to to you know track data on um and then i just like drew a bunch of dragons and shit like that and like drew maps and like i think there was some sort of plot about there was some weird i don't remember whether there was a scenario or whether it was actually thinking about conquest but there's some weird conquesty stuff in there too about uh I don't know, invading places and different uh, different tanks and airplanes and stuff. You know, what was uh, what was so secret about it? Because you were very adamant in the in the illustration that what 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 can what's behind this page is uh, <laughs> is very very sensitive material. Well, there's also a chance that I may have drawn some breasts or something in there. Like I think there's, <laughs> if I'm if I'm thinking about, it, I'm like, well, there's there's definitely a chance. There's definitely a do, you remember, do you remember how old you were when you drew that? Uh, I think maybe seven or eight. So there might have been like a very exploratory breast in there, but it was probably it was probably <laughs> mostly it was probably mostly world conquest plans. I was like, for a, for a seven or eight year old, you were very that's a very worldly uh, <laughs> thing to have in your mind, like to, the concept of of uh, of breasts, because like. When I was seven or eight, I is hundred percent that didn't even enter my mind. I I was probably still playing with GI Joes and Star Wars figures. Well, you know, you got to learn sometime. You got to learn sometime. Indeed, indeed. Now, one of your uh, one of your stories, Good Business, was actually adapted into a short film that got quite a bit of buzz online. What was that like to see your own comic come to life? Uh, that was extremely cool. Well, as you can see, the high explosive rounds are tremendously effective against soft shell targets as well as armor. What you fellas think? What do you fellas think? The director Ray Sullivan is a a very a very skilled uh, director over in Ireland. Um, and he also does like CG stuff and he's, cause he did all the, he did all the creatures, uh, himself and all the animation himself too, if I remember correctly. Um, and yeah, basically just masterminded the whole thing, uh, and created, uh, yeah, and did a very awesome, faithful adaptation of, of, of the short story I was working on. Um, now who, who instigated this whole process? Did you actively try to initiate uh, getting it made into a short film? Did he approach you? How did that all start? Uh, that that started because uh, I think Ray had just read the comic and was into it, and he was and he could visualize how he would make it into a comic. So he he uh, he courted me basically until until I was like, all right, that's, that's what I do. well, you've done uh, you've done a fair bit of work with Ed Brisson. Now, how did your relationship start? Was it primarily through his publishing company, New Reliable Press? Kind of, yeah. So when I first interacted with Ed, I was going to art school and he had put out a call on, I think a concept art form um, for an artist for a crime story. So I sent him what 
what would become Dan's Atomic Heart. Um, and he was like, oh, that's cool. And then, you know, took a note of it and we like, we corresponded a tiny bit. But then uh, as, the, as I got further along in the story, I started to look around. I was like, well, what small publishing companies exist um, that maybe could help me bring this, this comic to fruition. So mm -hmm. uh, I ended up, I think through Ink Studs actually, finding out about New Reliable Press, um, which was Ed's, Ed's publishing company at the time. And I submitted the, I submitted Yan's Atomic Heart to him and he was surprised because he had already, we'd already exchanged emails and then both completely forgot. And then- uh, Right, so just out of the blue, one day he received this, this email from you and be like, hey, check it out. Here's my fully completed comic, ready to go. So, yeah, and he was like, oh shit, this is, uh, I've seen this already. Now, a lot of comic fans probably know you best for your run on profit as a rotating artist. Now, mm -hmm. how did that project come about? I think, I think how that all worked out was uh, somebody approached Brandon about, or Brandon Graham, who spearheaded the whole project, about doing um, a reboot of, of Rob Liefeld's Profit, which, um, you know, was kind of, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of people remembered it. And I remember I had actually bought, I think my older brother had bought a copy of it out of the quarter bin um, when we were little kids, too. Um, the original series? Yeah, the OG 1993. Yeah. Um, and like, I, I remember I was like, oh, yeah, I looked at that. And like, that was the whole, that was the depth of my memory. Like, I didn't really, it didn't, it didn't leave a big, a big impression. But it yeah, did. I mean, was, some, of, some of Rob Liefeld's early stuff, um, you know, is an acquired taste, I think, even though at the time it may not have seemed that way because it was selling millions of copies, like everyone from Image at the time. You know, but uh, yeah. like, was he involved in it at all? Do you do you know if like was Rob Liefeld like you know what would be really cool right now? Let's revive Profit. I think that he basically he had all these properties, and was keen on getting money out of them. And that, not that that's like a mercenary thing. He kind of he cooked up the scheme. He talked to Image, um, and uh, it was actually nice because he was not really involved at all. Uh, in a in a way that like I th was was quite interesting because he just he just completely hands off he didn't I think he he approved some stuff early on and then very rapidly just didn't didn't really need to be involved and wasn't interested uh, and which is also awesome because we had nobody looking over our, our shoulder and we got to do kind of whatever we wanted for the for the story which um, is not always the case in uh, in work for hire situations I think working on profit did spoil me for working on other comics, just, just because I could kind of draw whatever I wanted. I didn't have to stay on model. I could just invent aliens on the page. And, you know, it was very, it was a very fun uh, kind of loose project to work on. Yeah. Now you started out, uh, you started out by mostly drawing other people's scripts, you know, but now you write all your own comics, you know, like you mentioned before on Patreon and you're even writing for another artist with your new series, Protector. Now what incited you to sort of make that jump? Uh, originally way back in, uh, before I went to art school, I was working on a bunch of comic projects. Um, and I remember trying to, trying to recruit, uh, another, like a young writer to help me. Cause I was not confident in my story stuff. Um, but then I just quickly found out that, um, I was trying to, I was kind of like, it's like the classic bad client thing where. You know, they're like, I don't know what I want, but I know this isn't it, you know, like, um, which, which sucks when you're working from, for someone like that. Um, but that was kind of my, that was who I was like trying to interact with other artists because like, or with, with other writers, because um, I had something intangible and specific in mind. Um, and I kept have I kept, you know, talking to friends and talk with other people and trying to collaborate and it wouldn't quite jive until I was like, oh, well, I guess I'll just work on this by myself. And then once I actually started doing that, um, once I believed in myself, uh, yeah. then, uh, yeah, then I, then I got way more into it. Um, it's very freeing when you know that you're, that you're, you know, you're coming up with your own ideas and, uh, and developing, developing them yourself, uh, rather than stick to someone else's script, but it's also quite frightening. You know, because uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know how you feel about it, but whenever I put something out there, 
uh, there's always that little thought in the back of my head going, Oh, what if people don't like this? Or, you know, it's, yeah. it's not as good as it could be or. Yeah. I feel like that's, that's always going to be present to some extent, but um, I don't know. Cause also like with, with work for hire is that you can also be, that can also be freeing uh, for, for me at least, because um, you know, I only, I have a discrete part that I'm responsible for. And mm-hmm. so I don't really need to, I don't need to take personally how people react to it if they react badly. Um, because, you know, as long as I did my job, then mm-hmm. I can feel satisfied having done that. Um, sure. Now, I don't know. I don't know if you, uh, this is a, a totally random question coming out of nowhere. Now, I don't know if you'd consider yourself a Trekkie, but uh, <laughs> people that know you know that you love Star Trek. So I got to ask you a very controversial question. What is the best series and who is the best captain? And that's a pretty tough, that's a pretty tough thing to answer. I, cause my, my instinct is to say that deep space nine is the best. Series. Oh, interesting. For the, for, for my taste. Um, but that, and this is also, I haven't rewatched deep space nine since I blasted through it and, uh, like with with Star Trek and a lot of these like long form shows, I feel like part of the appeal is that you get Stockholm syndrome because <laughs> you develop a parasocial relationship with uh, the characters on the show that you're binge watching for hours and hours and hours and hours on end. So um, you know, it's kind of, of trying to objectively evaluate something that you're like you brainwashed yourself into being in love with uh, is kind of difficult. But Deep Space Nine in particular, for me, my memories of Deep Space Nine compared to the other Star Trek series is that it felt like it had more of a revolving door of like alien creatures, right? Because everyone was kind of coming to the, yeah. to, the, to the station a lot and like docking in there and there would be a new adventure or a new mystery or something that revolved around that particular character where you didn't really get that as much with some of the other Star Trek shows. So I can kind of see where, why that might be your favorite. Yeah, because it's also it's a, it's like a little bit you know hornier and greasier, a, l- a little bit compared to some of the other ones. Um, it's also uh, again being being kind of a you know a current affairs world history enthusiast. Um, there's all sorts of interesting parallels between like the 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 wars in Yugoslavia and the collapse of the Soviet Union and these kind mm-hmm. of '90s. Um, these big 90s conflicts that were happening while they were writing Deep Space Nine. So there's lots of interesting, like the the whole relationship between the um, Bajorans and the Cardassians um, is super, like I, that was my favorite part of it. Like, you know, how do you, how do you deal with your powerful neighbor who enslaved you for a generation? And they're still around, but they've left. But, you know, you still might have to work with them a bit. They, but, you know, they did, you know, put all your family in a death camp, you know, which is a real, like, that's a real thing that people all around the world have to deal with um, is yeah. Negotiate mm-hmm. and, you know, and the mass murderers, like lots of those guys live yeah. and go on to live lives and have to deal with, um, yeah, have to have to deal with the things that they've done. Um, yeah. I mean, that's one of the interesting things about Star Trek in general as well as why it's, 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 why every series has kind of stood the test of time is because they do offer a lot of parallels to, to real life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that kind of comes back to one of your earlier questions about like how you can explore the present through, mm-hmm. through, you know, allegorical science fiction, you know, cause that's maybe, maybe even more so than, you know, what I said about like, you know, gaming, using science fiction to game out a scenario also just kind of uh, constructing very rich allegories for real world events through science mm-hmm. fiction. It's like, um, it's a very cool thing you can do with science fiction. So your, your love of DS9, does that mean that Benjamin Sisko is your favorite captain? No. No? <laughs> no. I do, me- like, I, I'm, I'm tempted to say uh, the Kirk is maybe my favorite, just because I really like... Um, what era, like- what era of Kirk, though? Are we talking original... We're talking OG, Kirk? OG Kirk. Yeah, I OG. think OG Kirk is my fave just because it's most like, um, it's like, he's he's just like a, a ballsy, super smart swashbuckler. Like, it's very pulpy, 
it's very cheesy um and like even though there's a lot of real stinkers in the original series like episode wise there's oh, also yeah. like the hype for me the the handful of incredible episodes of uh the original series or maybe my i think that's my favorite track well while, while we're on the topic of science fiction uh what are some underrated sci-fi movies or books that uh that you think everyone needs to watch or read Ooh, that's uh that's a tough question too because also uh i have learned too that my taste is not uh like not that it's so refined but just like i like things that are often maybe a little shitty or like weird that's just okay you know, you um, know one of my one of my favorite sci-fi movies is probably one of the worst movies of all time and it's called battle truck <laughs> that's a great name yeah it's battle basically truck. new zealand new zealand's answer to mad max for the warlords death is a way of life oh that sounds pretty awesome actually yeah <laughs> One of the most enjoyable pieces of sci-fi garbage you'll ever watch. Yeah, I, I have two two movies that I do that I would highly recommend um, are uh, they're both Soviet ones. So one would be uh, a kind of a comedy sci-fi called Kin Zaza, like K I N D Z A D Z A. Um, okay. And where can we find that? Like just on YouTube. Netflix have it or. Just YouTube. Uh, tons of Soviet era movies are just on the the most film uh, YouTube channel. Um, oh wow! Okay, cool. And you know, sometimes they get taken off. I, you know, I don't know exactly why and when things get removed by by the Russians, but um, <laughs> their usefulness has come to an end. <laughs> yeah, like there was one movie called uh, Heart of a Dog that I was watching, and I paused it one day, and when I came back. Uh, the Len Film account had decided to just remove all the English subtitles, and so I couldn't. I couldn't finish watching the. I couldn't finish watching it. I had to find a, a grubbier copy. But but no, Kin Zaza is a, is a great movie um, about a couple of of uh, Soviet citizens who accidentally find themselves uh, on a horrible uh, on a horrible desert planet where there's only two words and. Uh, everybody is like an evil liar and so it's okay. a, these people basically like trying to debase and lie to survive this kind of like terry gilliam hell world um and it's uh it's it's wonderful it's wonderful um and then there's another this is based on a very good book called hard to be a god um by the brother strugatsky but um it's a movie about a, a or rather the, the the story that that all this is based off is is about a uh, scientist from like a future, a future perfect communist society on earth that's now traveling the stars and embedding like secret anthropologists kind of Star Trek style into other societies to study them. But the problem is um, they go to this planet that is right on the cusp of a scientific renaissance. But then there's a big, uh, basically like a big coup by like, regressive forces that start to kill every intellectual. And so it's about this kind of Star Trek anthropologist type character um, who is kind of super powered, but his mission is that like, he's not allowed to kill anybody. So it's him like trying to uh, not kill these barbarians who are destroying their own planet uh, and who he hates. So it's like there's it's a very uh, it's a very uh, I don't know tense weird story uh, and there's a 2013 movie of it that is black and white and beautiful and very hard to watch and very full of boogers. Now Simon, uh, unfortunately, our time has come to an end here, uh, and now is that time to reveal what you've been drawing this whole time. All right. Well, it's not quite finished, which uh, is something you know we can all learn about for next time, but. So far, we've got a uh, whoa. We got a, a caveman hanging out beside a mech, and then in the background, it's not quite finished yet, but a, a mech with a woolly mammoth severed head on top. <laughs> so uh, I very on brand. It. Yeah, exactly. It's it's just it's really the way it had to be. <laughs> That's amazing. So uh, if anyone out there is watching and you want to own this awesome piece of art. 
Uh, we're going to be posting an auction link down below. Now, all profits uh, of this piece will go to a charity. Simon, who are we, uh, who are we giving the profits to once again? Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation. Exactly. Uh, all the pros, all the profits are going to go to that wonderful charity and everything that they do. Simon, I want to thank you so much for being cornered with us today. Tell the people out there what you're currently working on and what they can expect from you in the future. Ooh. Um, well, I've got a book that was coming out before quarantine hit called Protector, but uh, we're on track to at least print the rest of the issues and put out the trade paperback. So they're printing issues again of Protector. Um, uh, written by me and uh, Daniel Benson, who's a, a cool sci-fi author that I know who lives in Bulgaria, um, drawn by Artem Trakhanov, who um, is a very cool artist in St. Petersburg, and then colored by Jason Wordy, who uh, is a longtime pal and collaborator, collaborator of mine from uh, art school. Um, so what, what issue are, are we currently at right now with Protector? I think issue three came out like the week everything started to really shut down and then issues four and five um, will be coming out later in the summer followed by the trade paperback. So all that stuff will be coming out uh, presumably once everything is safer. Um, but uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see. It's hopefully it'll all be accessible at some point in the near future. Indeed. And uh, with the, when it comes to the trade paperback version, can we expect any cool extras uh, in the back pages? Oh yeah, we're we're cooking up we're cooking up some real some real tasty uh, sci-fi gumbo for people to snack on. Um, yeah, it'll 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 be it'll be it'll be not a giant amount, but there'll be there'll be some treats. There'll be some treats coming in there. Obviously, worth your while for all you comic fans out there. I want to take this time to thank all of you guys for watching our first episode of Drawn and Cornered. Uh, remember to bid and make sure to subscribe. Click that little bell icon to get notified for future episodes. Trust me, you don't want to miss our next guest. Once again, Simon Roy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.